So we are very close uh, to, to the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro too. And uh, our work is developed in the quantum optics lab in the physics institute so in, in this university. And uh, we are uh, uh, supported by the Brazilian agency, CNPq, Capes Fapeg, and we are part of the National uh, Institute for Quantum Information. So um, uh, uh, what I'm going to, to, the outline of my talk will be more or less the following. So I will uh, start with the basics of uh, paraxial modes and uh, scalar vortices in, in, in optics and uh, how these, in this context, of uh, paraxial optics, we can um, uh, realize this uh, tensor product space when we combine the scalar vortices, uh, spatial modes with polarization degree of freedom. And then we can identify non factorable structures as the so called vector vortices. And uh, we will discuss some similarities, uh, briefly discuss some similarities between this uh, classical optical context and, the, and the, the context that we usually, the mathematical uh, context that we usually find in quantum mechanics regarding uh, entangled states. And we will also briefly discuss uh, how can we use some quantum inequalities such as the Bell-like uh, Bell -like inequalities uh, to characterize this kind of uh, structural non-separability uh, between polarization and transverse modes. Then I will switch to the main topic of my talk, which is the how uh, we, we play uh, with these degree of degrees of freedom in nonlinear optics, uh, uh, most notably in second harmonic generation and optical parametric oscillations. And then I will draw my conclusions. So uh, just as a, a brief introduction, as we, I discussed with Constantine, many of you or are already acquainted to this, uh, this subject, but uh, it may be useful for those who are not. Uh, so essentially the vortices in, 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 uh, in, in, in classical optics, they appear as uh, optical beams with a, a, a twisted, wait just a minute. Okay, uh, as a twisted uh, uh, wavefront, wavefront like, like this one that I'm showing here. And uh, in fact, they are interesting because uh, when, when, when we talk about the angular momentum carried by a light beam, uh, we can separate this angular momentum. Uh, this, it, the angular momentum is a parable. If we are dealing with uh, paraxial beams, then we can make a, a clear separation between a spin part of the angular momentum and an orbital part of the angular momentum. The spin part is associated to the polarization state is the usual uh, uh, angular momentum carried by uh, circularly polarized beams. But we can also uh, assign some angular momentum to, uh, to the orbital or the wavefront structure of the optical beam. So when the, we have orbital angular momentum carried in the beam, we have an optical vortex, and these characterize a, actually a phase vortex. So we can produce them in, in, in the lab uh, by using holographic techniques, such as, for example, by diffracting uh, an incoming Gaussian beam in, a, in a, 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 a spiral zone plate like those shown here in this, in this figure. Uh, to generate the optical vortices. And uh, of course, I, I forgot to say that these vortices, they have uh, a, a parameter that characterize them that, are the, that is the topological charge. Essentially is the number of two pi cycles that the phase of the field uh, make, uh, makes when we, we turn around uh, uh, the propagation direction uh, uh, by two pi, okay? So we can prepare with this holographic, uh, with this, uh, holographic techniques, we, we can pre prepare beams with uh, different topological charges. 
and essentially these spirals on plates they, what they do they they focus the beam and also they imprint some kind of twist on the wavefront and after recollimation by a regular spherical beam uh, a spherical lens we obtain a collimated optical vortex okay so uh, we can also produce uh, uh, the, the optical vortices, these phase vortices with uh, forked uh, diffraction gratings, like this one shown here, where the, we have a topological defect and by centering the, uh, an incoming Gaussian beam on this defect, we have the vortices prepared on the, on the, the diffracted orders. So uh, to have an idea on uh, about how they, these vortices they look like in the lab, we have, this is we plot here some calculation for the intensity pattern and also for the interference pattern with the plane wave and we see here for example this spiral uh, uh, bright and dark fringes that characterizes the vortex so essentially uh, uh, these vortices they naturally appear in paraxo optics theory uh, when we find uh, uh, we search for solutions of the paraxial wave equation uh, and either in rectangular co uh, coordinates or in cylindrical coordinates. What happens is that when we solve this equation in, in, in uh, rectangular or Cartesian coordinates, we have a family of solutions that are the so-called Hermit Gaussian modes that are products of uh, Hermit polynomials uh, 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 and Gaussian functions that characterize that, that gives the, 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 the name of this family here. And they look like the, the intensity patterns associated with those uh, uh, modes uh, are displayed like here for the first uh, three orders, the fundamental mode, the first order and second order. When we solve this equation in, in cylindrical coordinates, we have the Laguerre Gaussian families. Again, we have, we have these uh, a Gaussian function multiplied by Laguerre polynomials of the radial co uh, coordinate in, in the cylindrical system but also we can have some kind of phase dependence on the azimuthal uh, coordinate, which characterize the vortex, uh, uh, the vortex structure. So here we also uh, uh, plot the, the first three orders, the fundamental first order and second order. The interesting thing is that um, there is a, a unitary transformation that brings from one family to the other family and back and act, actually, this transformation is block diagonal in the sense that it connects uh, the, uh, independently all the orders, all the orders. So we can realize, for example, an SU2 symmetry if we restrict our, uh, our experiments to first order modes. So here we, we can realize in the first order an SU2 structure. And also, if we go to the second order, we would have an SU3 structure and so on. But the interesting thing is that uh, since we have an SU2 structure here on the first order, uh, you can also represent all uh, linear combinations of, uh, uh, of, a, of a, ortho a pair of orthogonal first order modes, any co uh, linear combination of, uh, of such modes can be represented on a Poincaré sphere in analogy to what is done to polarization. So for example, we have here in, on the equator, all uh, orientations of first order emit Gaussian modes, not only the vertical and horizontal uh, displayed here, but also those that are uh, rotated by uh, arbitrary angles. And we have on the poles, the optical vortices, the right-handed and left-handed uh, optical vortices that are analogous to circular polarization. And in between, we have what is analogous to elliptical polarization. So we can represent arbitrary first order modes in a Poincaré sphere. So the interesting thing is that uh, not, it's not only a formal representation of the modes, but we can actually make transformations on this sphere by using uh, a, um, a telescope, uh, an astigmatic telescope, a, a telescope with cylindrical lenses that we call it an astigmatic mode converter that can, for example, convert a uh, Hermit Gaussian mode into a Laguerre Gaussian, uh, 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 a Laguerre Gaussian vortex mode, for example. 
and this is done we can understand this as a, a unitary in terms of this su2 structure it's easy to understand this telescope acts as a unitary uh, transformation in which for example if the, the telescope is oriented at 45 degrees we can identify the two eigenvectors of this transformation that are emit Gaussian modes at plus 45 and minus 45. When we input a vertical emit Gaussian mode in this uh, stigmatic mode converter, it, the, the two, uh, and we, if we think about the decomposition of this incoming mode into the eigenvectors of the, of the transformation, we can see that uh, the, the, the two components will acquire different phases. And then this is how we obtain the optical vortex out of the astigmatic mode converter, okay? So the, the mode converter will uh, 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 introduce a pi over two phase shift between these two components of the incoming beam. This will produce this, uh, uh, this other combination as the output that act, uh, actually corresponds to the uh, first order like a Gaussian mode. So this is a way uh, of going from the equator of the sphere to the pole, for example, with a stigmatic mode converter. So, of course, we can then uh, uh, borrow some, some notation from uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, we see that, for example, we, can, we, we, we see a formal equivalence between the mathematical description of what is called a uh, qubit in quantum mechanics, uh, arbitrary superposition, uh, uh, a two-level system essentially, like a spin half particle or, uh, or, or any other system with two levels. Okay, and also the same kind of combinations we can do in classical optics with polarization unit vectors by generating elliptical polarization and or. Uh, linear polarization, circular polarization, and the same for first order modes like this, okay? So now we, we, we turn to this, uh, this question of uh, spin orbit non-separability that gives rise to what is called a vector beam. Huh? So what we, we see is that, for example, like in quantum mechanics, when we have a bipartite system, A and B, uh, we can we build the uh, uh, the vector space of states in of the combined system. We can build it, uh, for example, a basis by simply making the tensor product of uh, of, uh, uh, of the basis state of system A and the basis state of system B, and then we produce an, a basis for the combined system. However, in the combined space, we can we, we have more stuff we, we have a, a more complex structures since there are vectors belonging to this new space the combined space that cannot be factorized in this way and these are the so-called entangled states in quantum mechanics for a two qubit uh, system uh, if we are restricted to pure states then we can quantify and uh, uh, the, the, um, the amount of entanglement by the so-called concurrence. Uh, so if we take this uh, general combination of two qubit states, we have this definition for the concurrence that runs from zero to product states to one to maximally entangled states, such as the so-called Bell states. So these are example, these Bell states here are example of maximally entangled states that uh, present concurrence one. Okay, now let's turn to this uh, classical optical context. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking here, I'm saying here that it's classical optics because I'm not referring to quantum states. Uh, the old wave functions that appear here, they are functions of classical op uh, optics. They are solutions of the paraxial wave equations that, are, that is the equation uh, derived in, in the realm of classical optics. We don't need to quantify the field to realize this mathematical structure that I'm going to talk about. So if we think about a general uh, paraxial mode, first order paraxial mode, uh, combined with its polarization, we can think about arbitrary spatial modes, any combinations of uh, first order modes that carry a single polarization, uh, which can be also uh, arbitrary, but it's a single polarization for the whole beam. This is what we call a separable mode, okay? 
However, we can conceive in this, uh, in this context modes that cannot be factorized in this way. So these are what we call by analogy with the quantum in the, uh, to the quantum mechanical states, we call these bell modes. So here, this H and V subscript, they, they refer to first order Hamid Gaussian modes that are horizontally polarized, uh, horizontally oriented or vertically oriented. And then the, these two orthogonal spatial modes can be uh, combined with uh, the polarization, uh, with polarization, with orthogonal polarizations, and this uh, any coherent superpositions like this this one displayed here will uh, form uh, a whole beam, a whole parallel beam that does not have a well-defined polarization mode, but this more complex combination here. So when we combine the linear spatial modes A and V with linear polarization modes A and V, we can have these two combinations, H H plus or minus V V and H V plus or minus V H that are analogous to the four Bell states here. And then we can uh, borrow concepts from quantum information theory. We can uh, think about a more, the most general first order mode in this way and also use the concurrence uh, to quantify the amount of separability between the spatial part and the polarization part okay so what but what what's the physical meaning of this uh, this kind of uh, structurally non-separable modes so uh, essentially we understand them as the so-called vector vortices actually uh, what what we have is that uh, one single beam prepared on one such such a, a combination uh, will present um, a, an inhomogeneous polarization along the wavefront, uh, over the wavefront. So we have here the, the, the representation of the polarization state of the four Bell modes that uh, I defined previously. So these are the radio polarization, uh, the azimuthal polarization, and these two are called the counter rotating polarizations uh, because the polarization rotates up. Uh, when I rotate around the beam, the, the polarization rotates uh, in the opposite sense. Okay. And uh, there are many ways to, to produce one of those, be uh, those uh, vector beams. Uh, in the literature, we have this so called pew plates developed with, in the Italian group of Lorenzo Marucci. Uh, that work with the liquid crystals. There are also uh, commercially available S plates that you can buy now in Tor Labs or Altecna, the Lithuanian uh, manufacturer, that you just shine a regular Gaussian beam and then out of the, this, this S plate, you get a radially polarized mode, for example. Now, what is interesting is that, for example, the, we can exploit this kind of uh, analogy with quantum mechanics. For example, if we, we know that uh, uh, maximally entangled states, they, they, uh, they have some symmetry properties, some, uh, uh, like, for example, the, the rotation invariance. For example, suppose you have the two uh, 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 a two qubit system and you can def uh, define for each qubit the rotated basis theta and theta prime according to this uh, uh, rotation uh, operation here. And then what happens is that if you have a, a state psi plus, which is zero, zero plus one, then in any rotated basis, this will display the same kind of uh, angular correlation. So either the two qubits are oriented at the same angle theta or on the orthogonal angle, uh, angle theta prime. So it's a rotation invariance that tells you that, okay, if you project one qubit along a given orientation theta, whatever this orientation is, the other qubit will be projected along the same, the same orientation. So also, of course, we can uh, translate this kind of symmetry to the optical context in which for example, you can define 
a rotated uh, polarization modes and rotated uh, emit Gaussian modes and using the same rotation operation. And the same is true here, of course. Uh, if you have a radially polarized uh, mode, it will remain uh, 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 the same kind of combination of a rotated emit Gaussian mode with uh, uh, a rotated polarization mode combined with the orthogonal uh, with the orthogonal version of this combination, okay? And of course, there is a visual, uh, there is a visual and appealing uh, uh, approach to this uh, symmetry because we see clearly that when we look at this figure here, that is, it, it, it's rotational invariance, invariance okay? We, so this is visually uh, obvious here, but we can see also mathematically. And the interesting, the funny thing is that we can realize this kind of symmetry in in a lab in a very very simple experiment that we do i always do with the, the students when they come to the lab and i explain this this stuff to them so we we just prepare a radially polarized beam transmit it through a polarizer we rotate the polarizer and then we take the image and what we see here is that it should be i should have a video oh, okay so there you go. As we rotate the polarizer, the image trans, uh, transmitted through the polarizer is a mid Gaussian image that rotates with the polarizer. Okay, so it's the same kind, we are experiencing the same kind of symmetry that we have, for example, in quantum mechanics, when, when we project one qubit along uh, a given direction, the other qubit is projected along the same direction. So this is what we, we are seeing here. Uh, in this uh, projection that we we do uh, on the polarization degree of freedom, but then it results in on projection in the spatial part also. Okay. So, what about a Bell inequality in this context? What can uh, what can uh, quantum-like inequalities help us in this context? Well, the, the interesting thing is that so I, I just briefly. Uh, 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 we call here the, the Bell measurement uh, scheme. So we have two uh, qubit system to, to spin half particles, for example, and they, they can be prepared, for example, in any kind of two, qub uh, two qubit states, uh, entangled states or whatever. And uh, we can do independent measurements on their qubits in different kind of bases, okay? Uh, that are characterized by these uh, rotated Pauli matrices here, uh, sigma of theta and sigma of phi, uh, with rotated with uh, independent uh, rotated angles. And as we do measurements on these rotated rotated bases, we can compute this quantity here. That is the difference between obtaining the same result on two q on the two qubits measurement or uh, uh, and obtaining uh, opposite results in the two qubits. So, so if we make this difference here, we have this quantity M that is a function of the orientation angles theta and phi of the remote polarizers, for example. And if we build this combination here, we have this parameter S that tells us that if uh, S is, uh, uh, if, if, the, if the system Okay, so then we have two different approaches to this uh, to this uh, discussion here. One is so we can we can use this parameter to characterize uh, uh, if the to, to certify if the quantum state of the two qubits is entangled or not. So if the if it is a, if it's if this parameter s is larger, its absolute value is larger than two. So you must have some entangled state between those two. And uh, if if it's a, if it's a separable state, then it must be smaller than two, okay. But then it's it's the, the inequality being used as a witness, as an entanglement witness. Another a different a, a role of the inequality is to discuss the quantum classical border. So if the two, if these measurements are ruled by classical probabilities, then we must have this quantity smaller than two. If it has uh, if it is larger than two, then 
we have this, uh, this, this cannot be described by classical probabilities. There must be some kind of quantum description uh, to these measurements, okay? So these are two different roles as a witness. So you don't, you don't care about uh, whether the world is classical or quantum. You just accept it as quantum and you can use the S parameter as a witness of entanglement, okay? Or you have this quantum classical discussion uh, that can be also addressed by this kind of inequality. So the role that is important in this classical optimism con context is the role of witness, okay? So the interesting stuff is that, for example, when we have this combined mode, spin orbit uh, uh, mode, okay? We can use this kind of interfer Mach-Zender interferometer with an additional mirror in which you have, for example, uh, if we shine an arbitrary first order superposition uh, vector mode or whatever, or separable, it doesn't matter. What happens is that in, in the two outputs, when this uh, interferometer is balanced, the two outputs will actually uh, separate the, 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 let's say, correlated spin orbit modes, the H, H, and V, V intensities on one side and H, V, and V, H on the other side, okay? And if you take the difference, then you have what is the analogous of the parameter M, the difference between H, H plus V, V, and H, V plus V, H, okay? If you precede this interferometer with dull prism that makes rotation in the spatial part, and a wave plate that makes rotations in the polarization part, then with, by varying independently the angles theta and phi, you can you have the difference between the uh, projected intensities. Here there is a there is a misprint here. This should be actually I don't know what happened because it should be plus plus minus minus here, and plus minus minus plus here. There is some misprint. I don't know what happened but this is what it should be. So we can measure this quantity M as a function of theta and phi. And what we find is that again, as in the quantum mechanical case, if the mode is separable, then this quantity S must be smaller than two. If the quantity S is larger than two, then you, you can be sure even without addressing locally these polarization properties of the of the beam, you can with bucket detector you can uh, realize that there is some kind of vector vortex structure on the beam. Okay, so this is the inequality in being used in the role of a witness of a non-separability witness. Okay, uh, regarding the quantum classical description, this is a another seminar. <laughs> it would be another another uh, discussion, okay? So for our uh, classical optical implementation, we, we, we can use this inequality as a witness to, uh, to evidence some kind of vector vorticity in the beam without needing to address local details of the beam with bucket detectors and this uh, uh, interferometer and the polarization analysis, we can uh, we can uh, discover that there is some kind of vector vorticity on the beam. Okay. So this is what is important. Um, now let's turn to the main topic, which is nonlinear optics with vector beams. So all these non-separability issues, we have discussed this for a long time in our group. And then we started to become more interested in on how to use it, especially on how to use it in uh, nonlinear optics. How can we use those, those this structural non-separability in nonlinear optics, and uh, especially to control nonlinear optical processes? Okay, so this was the main uh, uh, motivation of the, the the work that is now following here in the seminar. So let's just go back to the first one of the first experiments with uh, optical vortices in nonlinear optics that date back to 96 when the authors they demonstrated that uh, optical vortex with topological charge m 
in second harmonic generation would have also its topological charge doubled. Okay, so it was a natural intuition. Okay, second harmonic generation doubles the frequency and it also doubles the topological charge. And, uh, uh, and it was uh, demonstrated in these very nice pictures that are uh, shown here in this reference uh, from 96, okay? Um, however, the interesting thing is that at that time, they didn't explain very well, but they, they did the experiment with type two phase match. So they were like shining uh, a, a linearly polarized beam, a vortex beam, polarized at 45 degrees with respect to the crystal axis. And, and then they would be, have uh, both uh, polar, polar, both components, horizontal and vertical, both of them uh, with topological charge M, okay? Then a natural question uh, is, okay, but uh, what, what happens if we like prepare what would be a vector beam after all? Because we can, for example, in these two uh, linear polarizations, you, you, these two uh, linear components, horizontal and vertical, we can uh, imprint independent topological charges and and combine them in a polar, on, a, uh, on a polarizing beam splitter and send to the to the second harmonic generation. So the first thing that we we did was okay. Uh, obviously, we can uh, in this case. Uh, produce the addition, direct addition of the incoming topological charges, okay, M plus N. But what was interesting was that by controlling the input polarization, if we rotate rigidly both incoming polarizations to, uh, uh, together, so we keep them orthogonal to each other, but uh, we can place a half wave plate before the crystal and rotate both polarizations rigidly. Then actually the interesting stuff is that we can produce not only the addition by, but by po polarization control, we can double one topological charge or the other topological charge independently. So we can control between addition of the two different topological charge, doubling one of them or doubling the other one by controlling the polarization. And this was interesting. So this was the experiment, how the experiment looked like. So let's, let me just be as, as brief as I can. So we have an Eugene Yag laser. We are going to make type two second harmonic generation here with a KTP crystal. Um, and we, we had a, one spatial light modulator to produce a variable topological charge, uh, LSLM here. And we had a, a phase mask that produced a fixed topological charge, L mask. And here we have uh, the two topological charges are recombined in this polarizing beam splitter. And here we have the wave plate that would rotate the two polarizations rigidly. So they remain orthogonal to each other, uh, but they are rotated together, okay? And by controlling the rotation, we could demonstrate uh, 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 the doubling of the top of the mask topological charge, the doubling of the SLM topological charge or the addition. The, the detection was made with a tilted uh, with a tilted lens that converts in the focal plane the the the, uh, the incoming Laguerre Gaussian beam. It it it, uh, it uh, converts to a Hermit Gaussian uh, pattern. That, that allows an easy count of the lobes and uh, measurement of the topological charge, okay? So it's a very simple way uh, to measure the topological charge is just to use a tilted uh, spherical lens, a tilted spherical lens that uh, naturally will uh, produce some astigmatism on the beam and make the pattern conversion from, Hamid, from Laguerre Gaussian to Hamid Gaussian. And then we could easily uh, measure the topological charge and demonstrate this polarization effect that allowed us to make independent uh, topological charge operations controlling the polarization, okay? Now, everything was 
was very interesting. And now I, I'm going to jump into some theory. And the reason for this was when we tried to, to add topological charges with the same size, for, for example, in this case, plus one and plus two, then we obtain the plus three here, very beautiful, no problem. But when we try to add opposite topological charges, we, we could see that we, we had the, the resulting topological charge, but there was something else. The images were less clear. We did not understand what was going on when we combine uh, opposite topological charges, okay, with opposite signs. And then we, we, we had to do some theory to understand what was going on, okay? So then we start to, to talk about these selection rules for this uh, parametric process with uh, OAMEs. So then I, I'll try to be as brief as I can. So this is the paraxial equation. So this is the paraxial and nonlinear equation, okay? So this is the evolution of the second harmonic field, the, 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 the equation here, the, the, the e to omega is the amplitude of the second harmonic field. And those two are the input fields, a polarized at H and V uh, polarizations, okay? And what we do here is that we can decompose each one of the interacting beams as a superposition of Laguerre Gaussian modes with given amplitudes, okay? P and L are radial numbers. Uh, wait a minute, that I will, are, are radial numbers that characterize the modes. L is the topological charge. And we, we can go from this, uh, this kind of uh, 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 spatial um, uh, differential equation, okay? to this partial differential equation, we can go to this multi-mode coupled equations that are ordinary differential equations, but they are infinitely coupled uh, between all amplitudes of the, mo of the beams participated in the interaction, okay? The important thing is that the, the coupling between the different modes is mediated by these coefficients here that are related to three mode overlap. So here, what is going to rule the coupling between different modes is this three mode integral here. Okay, this three mode integral here. And it's, a, it's an integration over the plane uh, transverse to the propagation direction. Okay. And then uh, of course, in, 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 in cylindrical coordinates, we have an angular integration and we have the radial integration also, okay. So the so this is was just uh, to, to for those who are not who are not acquainted to Laguerre Gaussian modes the Laguerre Gaussian modes they have this general expression we have a Gaussian term here uh, we have the Laguerre uh, generalized Laguerre polynomial here a monomial and the topological charge uh, term here okay so this parameter p is the radial uh, the radial mode uh, is the radial uh, uh, how can I say coefficient, okay? And the order of the beams uh, in this uh, mode family is given by twice the radial order plus the absolute value of the uh, topological charge, okay? So this, this family here is an autonormal family and it's a complete set of uh, functions in, in two dimensions, okay? It can be used as a basis of arbitrary uh, patterns. And what happens, when we make the calculation of this, when, when we make the calculation of these overlap integrals for, for the couple, for, to, to, to evaluate the coupling between the modes, what we see is a very interesting thing. When we make the, the angular, the angular uh, integration, we obtain the angular momentum conservation condition. So, which means essentially is that the topological charge of the second harmonic must be the sum of the topological charges of the incoming beams. It's okay, it's natural, it's very intuitive. Okay. But when we perform the radial integration, then something that is less intuitive comes up. 
when we combine beams with same topological charge, if the incoming beams for the second harmonic process have topological charge of the same sign, of the same sign, so the product is positive, and if they all, the input incoming beams, they have zero radial order, so they don't have any radial structure in the incoming beam, then nothing is generated in the second harmonic, okay? So input beams, fundamental beams, without radial structure and topological charge of the same sign that rotate in the same sense, then no radial structure is created in the second harmonic. However, when they have opposite signs, for example, if I combine plus one and minus one, then what happens is that the second harmonic carries the added topological charges as, as it should be, okay? However, you generate radial orders. So you have radio, an additional radial order and the selection rule here is the following. You generate radial orders uh, from zero until the minimum between the absolute value of the topological charge being mixed. Okay, so in, in the beginning we didn't have we didn't have more than this. It was a mathematical fact, okay, that appeared like that, and uh, we we saw it in the experiment. We saw it in the experiment. We didn't have an intuitive uh explanation for this now we we do have but i will leave it for the discussion part okay uh, so let's uh just go and see what happens so this is what when we calculate these overlap integrals we see that for example in the second harmonic we should produce p equal to zero topological charge so this is the mixing this is what what we calculate for the mixing between plus one and minus one in the second harmonic process okay so we should see we should get p equal to zero in the second harmonic with l equal to zero and p equal to one with l equal to zero but the calculation gives more it, it tells you also the relative phase of the coefficients so they should be in a pi uh different phase difference here and so this is the calculated image okay this is what we saw in the experiment in the beginning we was we were quite happy because okay we see a ring here and then we said okay it's it's the radio structure that we are waiting uh, for is there in someone but it doesn't look uh, uh exactly uh, like what we calculated and then we understood what was going on because we were measuring the images in the far field and what happened is that since the two uh, pa p parameters here are different okay we see that this superposition that we are generating in the near this is what we generate in the near field but they have different orders so they evolve with different gui phases so and when you calculate the gui phase difference at the far field region you see that this there is a pi phase difference that compensates this one so this minus sign in the far field is turned into a plus sign that's what happens and then when we accounted to, for this effect we found theoretically exactly what something more like what we uh, actually observed in the experiment okay and then we could also make measurements then we started to make to image the near field what was going what was leaving the face of the crystal we could uh, image this on the on the ccd camera and then we we could match the experiment and theory okay so and actually we then we, we could even make a film uh, film the evolution oh no Let me see if I can. I don't know. Well, it doesn't go. I don't know. We feel we could film this transition from. Let me see. No. 
Okay, the, the, I can show you afterwards uh, if you if you want. So, but we can we, we could we could film uh, see the transition uh, the, from the near to the far field and the the the, the change from this pattern from this pattern here to this pattern here. Okay, and actually now we have a more uh, intu intuition about this because what we see is that somehow this transition this this can be seen as a diffraction effect and actually you can we, we can gen we can think about this spot the center spot as a, a generalization of the poisson spot in which oh, of course we, you don't have in the near field a sharp hole uh, but you have something some kind of smooth hole because you have the, this uh, dark part here it doesn't have orbital angular momentum because you canceled in the second harmonic process, you cancel the orbital angular momentum. So you have this donut shape intensity distribution, okay, but without any OAM. So it's, since it doesn't have, the, so the OAM is what gives the stability to this donut shape. If it doesn't have OAM, then it will, uh, goes, uh, uh, undergoes diffraction. And this is what's happening here. And then we can understand this as a, a Poisson spot. And then, okay, we could solve these equations and the, the three mode equations. And there was something that was, so this for the co-rotating vortices or what we call co-rotating vortices when they, they have uh, the same, to, uh, same uh, the topological charge have the same sign, okay? And then we have only a three mode uh, dynamics. When they have, Uh, opposite signs, then we have a multi, in principle, multimodal dynamics. But what we saw, what was interesting is that we could actually reduce these, these uh, multimodal dynamics to a three mode dynamics, because we see that all higher radial orders that are generated, they are locked in phase and amplitude to the fundamental order, to the, to, to the most fundamental uh, P equal to zero order. They are not all independent. So you can always build a combination of uh, radial modes. And uh, when you build this combination of radial modes, you can reduce the multi-mode dynamics to a three-mode dynamics. And then all higher modes are slaved by the fundamental mode. So this is the, what we do. So this is a simulation of what we, the, the relative weights of, uh, of uh, radial modes when you combine, for example, plus 50 and minus 50 in second harmonic generation. Now, of course, we would be out of the, the paraxial regime in this case, and then we, we would have to adapt the theory. But then we call this this kind of multi-radial mode locked in, phase, in, in amplitude and phase, we call this a radial comb. It's, it's like an analogous of a frequency comb where you have mode locking fixing uh, these uh, uh, longitudinal modes of a laser cavity, okay? So these are experimental results that we, we obtain uh, for near field and far field by combining different topological charges, plus one, minus one, one and minus two, two and minus one, two and minus two, and we can see in each case the generation. The, for example, here we don't have a net topological charge, so we have the central spot in the far field, and here also zero net topological charge. And, but here we have one external uh, ring and here we can su see two external rings uh, as uh, predicted by the, by the selection rule. And also the combination uh, of, uh, topo uh, uh, of topological charge with a net topological charge. So we, see, we can see both the singularity in the far field and the external ring of the radial mode, okay? And these are the theoretical simulations. So this is a work that we published in 2017. And also uh, we could, um, we could uh, uh, repeat this experiment, but in, in a more uh, tricky way in which, for example, now here, what we did was to combine the two orthogonal polarizations, but in non-collinear configuration. So actually what we did was to uh, uh, slightly misalign within the band 
uh, the tolerance of the phase matching condition for the wavelengths being mixed, okay? But we slightly misalign the incoming beams, okay? So then the input beam would, could be seen as a three, uh, a triply non-separable structure because we have longitudinal mode, transverse mode, and polarization, okay? And there are the three uh, difference in this, uh, this superposition. And the interesting thing is that we could see simultaneously the three processes, okay? The, the, the forward, in the forward uh, second harmonic generation, we only obtain the doubling, independent doubling of the to topological charges. But then we had a third, a third uh, output here that was the, <clears throat> the added uh, wave vector, the added wave vector that would carry also the added topological charges. So the addition of linear momentum was accompanied by addition of angular momentum. And the interesting thing is that, again, we could control the relative intensities by controlling the input polarization, okay? So we, we would do the same experiment as before. We would rigidly rotate the two uh, polarizations here and then obtain uh, uh, the, the, in the same experiment, okay, we could, for example, with the SLM, imprint two independent topological charges, and the two beams were like slightly misaligned uh, here, and we have the wave plates to control the polarization states, the, the incoming polarization of the beam and the KTP crystal, and again, doing the image with the CCD camera, okay? So we could have three out second harmonic outputs here that could be imaged in the, on the CCD camera, okay? So this is what we have. When we have, we are, now I'm going to show all the, the, the results are for L1 equal to one, L2 equal to two. When we have one of them horizontally polarized, the other vertically polarized, we have only the addition uh, output by putting them at 22.5 degrees, we would have the three outputs here. So we see, okay, the three, the in, uh, independent topological charge doubling and the addition in the middle, okay, the three images simultaneously. And when we put them at plus 45 and minus 45 degrees, we have the independence doubling and there is a destructive interference that kills the addition channel the addition output, okay? So this is how we, we described, uh, so we, we really uh, went into a bit of theory to that and what, what we understand in this plus 45 and minus 45 uh, condition is that when you, when you look at this, uh, the, the horizontal and vertical components uh, of the two incoming beams for this plus 45 and, and minus 45, we see that the vertical components, they are in phase, but the horizontal components are in opposite phase. So what happens is that the two channels, so I can combine this vertical with this horizontal or this vertical with this horizontal, but the two combinations, the two paths, the two possibilities for generating the second harmonic, they will be uh, out of phase and they will interfere destructively. And this is why we don't see, and if you do the calculation, you can do the calculation of the, 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 the independent outputs, okay? As a function of the rotation angle or rotation angle. And we see here a sine function here and uh, uh, on, the, on the direct, on the forward second harmonic generation. And we see the cosine function of two theta for the addition channel, okay? And we see this happening, okay? Why the, the, the the, 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 the topological charge addition is faded, is, is canceled out. Uh, so we also have, we can interpret this in the quantum regime. Uh, we can, well, uh, there is also, there is still theory to be done on, on this subject, but we can understand if, for example, we imagine, uh, uh, for example, uh, in, in the general case, uh, wait a minute. Yes, we can, we can think, for example, 
that we have uh, different processes to generate the second harmonic. I can annihilate a two photon beam. Uh, uh, I can annihilate two photons from one in, uh, fundamental input to generate one second harmonic output. Okay, this is described by a Hamiltonian term like this one: two annihilation operations and one creation operation in the second harmonic. I can annihilate two photon from the other beam and generate one photon on the other second harmonic output. This is the kind of, uh, of, 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 of Hamiltonian term that we need. And we have also the possibility of annihilating one photon independently from each beam, input beam, and generate the, the addition channel photon here, okay? But then this would have two possible paths, okay? So these are the Hamiltonian terms that give rise to this, uh, to this kind of uh, process here, okay? And if the incoming photons are entangled, are in an entangled state like this one, then we would, see, we, we, we would have uh, destructive interference, okay? Destructive interference and this would kill the process, okay? Uh, if they are entangled. Uh, we could, we could for example, imagine what would happen if we could turn this minus into a plus to see if this process would be enhanced, enhanced somehow, okay? And this would be very interesting because this would be a manifestation of the bosonic, bosonic nature of the photons in this uh, up conversion process, okay? So this, uh, the, the quantum version of this experiment and exploiting the entanglement of be, uh, between the, the incoming photons, I think it uh, still remains to be done. And this would be an interesting subject for future development, uh, future collaboration, if you guys are interested. Uh, now I, I, I should uh, stop and ask how much time do I have, do I still have? Is the, have I used uh, one hour already or? Um, I think you have about five minutes, maybe. Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. If you. you. I, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Five minutes will be enough. So I will. I will just uh, briefly. I will go a bit fast on this. Okay. But we have also investigating uh, investigated this process in uh, second in, in optical parametric oscillation. So I'll I'll be a bit fast on this. Okay. So the first attempt to transfer uh, or, uh, orbital angular momentum in parametric down conversion was done here in 99, also in Miles, uh, uh, in Miles Padgett group, okay? So they, they tried to, they shined uh, an OAM beam in an LBO and they imaged the, the down converted beam. What they saw was a donut shape and the down converted beam in the near field, but then it, it evolved to adjust a, 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 how can I say, a, a diffracted uh, pattern uh, uh, in the far field, a, a scattered pattern in the far field without any kind, any signature of OAM, okay? And so there was no uh, deeper conclusion than they could not see the OAM transfer. This was clarified later in the group of Zeilinger in which they could make OAM analysis between the down converted photons, okay, independent OAM analysis. And they, they actually saw that uh, actually what happens is that you generate uh, all, possible, all possible partitions, OAM partitions between the signal and either uh, uh, photons. And, and if you make analysis, uh, OAM analysis on each port, then you will see the coincidence uh, on the uh, output channels that conserve uh, or, uh, or angular momentum with the incoming beam, okay? Back in 2002, we did the work uh, together with Paulo, uh, Paulo Ribeiro at the Federal University, where we uh, also uh, investigated the conserva OAM conservation in stimulated down conversion. This is almost a 20 years old uh, work, okay? But then there was, there was a question of, I'll go fast here. This is uh, actually what we, we started to, to investigate was what if we put 
the process inside an optical cavity and we have the cavity feedback uh, feeding back the process what how does the oam uh, behave in this uh, cavity assisted process uh, this we did uh, in, together with the people in sao paulo university okay uh, marcelo martinello and paulo Nussenzweig. okay so it's a collaboration with them and then we could see different uh, uh, OPO operations. Okay, so these are uh, this is the the, the pump uh, cavity resonance of the pump beam, and then each spike here is an OPO uh, operation where we could see generation of uh, down converted beams in the cavity, and these are the the, the we we could see, for example, four. Uh, operation peaks related to different operation conditions and we could see OAM transfer in two of them but we could not see OAM transfer in one of them okay so this we could explain this I won't go uh, uh, deep on this but we could explain this by a cavity and isotropy effect okay so it was an astigmatism uh, imposed by the crystal that was different for ordinary polarization and extraordinary polarization. The extraordinary polarization had less astigmatism and could receive OAM. Uh, however, the ordinary polarization was astigmatic in the crystal, so the cavity resonance would split and could not support simultaneous uh, oscillation of the two emit Gaussian modes that we needed the, 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 uh, to transfer the OAM. So this is why one polarization of the down converted beam could receive OAM, but the other one could not. The cavity was astigmatic to one beam, but not astigmatic to the other, okay? Now we have more general selection rules uh, that we derived. We, now we could repeat the experiment with, with more complex uh, pump. And we derived the selection rules that stated, so S here are the orders of the incoming modes and the uh, and outgoing modes. So S, uh, uh, this is the order of the, of the signal uh, beam, order of the either beam and order the order of the pump beam. So they, they must, the three orders must add uh, to a, how can I say, to an even number. Okay, so it must be an even number, and the order of the pump is smaller or equal to the added orders of the signal in idler. This is a selection rule that we derived, and we could check for a big family, a big family of pump, different pump, a mid Gaussian, a Gag Gaussian, different orders, and these are all operation conditions that we could verify in the OPO was uh, were subjected to this uh, selection rule. And uh, just to finish, uh, we could also see a symmetry, uh, an interesting symmetry effect when we inject the OPO. We could inject the OPO with a uh, adjustable elliptical mode, uh, see any, any mode in the Poincaré sphere. And what we, we could show that if the signal is injected in a given point on the Poincaré sphere, then the idler is generated in a point that is the mirror reflection of the signal along the equatorial plane. So it's not necessarily an orthogonal mode. It's, the, it's a mirror reflection here. It will be orthogonal if you inject Laguerre Gaussian. It will be the same mode if you inject a big Gaussian. But if you inject something in between, it will be this specular uh, it, it will have this specular uh, symmetry. And the reason, the physical reason for this is that this, is, this condition is the one that simultaneously conserve OAM and also uh, maximize the intensity overlap between signal and idler. This is the, the reason for this kind of symmetry that is imposed, okay? So uh, with this, I, 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 I can finish. Uh, so in summary, uh, what we have been working with uh, is essentially to establish some analogies between uh, this uh, no separability between spin and orbital degrees of field in classical optics and uh, how analogous it is to quantum entangled states. Uh, uh, we show that these kind of structural non-separability can be evidence, can be witnessed 
by using, by borrowing quantum-like inequalities from the quantum uh, uh, domain, okay? This kind of structural non-separability does not uh, uh, replace genuine quantum entanglement for quantum information tasks because there are essentially because there are no non-local effects, okay? So you, you can simulate some aspects of entanglement, of quantum entanglement, but it's, it's, you cannot do all, uh, all the, the things that you can do with genuine quantum entanglement, especially regarding non-local effects, okay? However, it allows us to test some properties of entanglement with simple experiments. So we have done many experiments with this, uh, with this uh, kind of aim. Uh, and also this kind of structural separability, for example, inspire new, new ways of uh, approaching classical optics, especially to, it, it gives you some intuition to, on how use different degrees of freedom to control nonlinear optical phenomena, okay? So this is uh, the main, uh, uh, our main subject right now is how we use this structural separability to control nonlinear optical processes. And uh, we have an ongoing cooperation with Paulo about this subject. We, are, we would like to, to, to exploit these radio uh, effects also in the down conversion and stimulated down conversion process. Okay, so these are the people involved in the, the work uh, works shown here. So it's myself uh, that I'm responsible for the quantum optics lab in our, in our university. Khaled Deshum is a theorist permanent theorist. Uh, Daniel Tasca is an experimentalist uh, working with the OAM beams. He did his postdoc a long time ago with Miles Paget. Carlos Souza works on the OPO experiments. Gabriel Alves was a uh, postdoc, but now he was, he was promoted to a permanent uh, position in our group. He uh, is also, also working on the, on the uh, OPO experiments. Rafael Barros is a, a, a PhD student. Leonardo Pereira is a postdoc uh, uh, working on the, on the theoretical part. Uh, Rafael works on the experiment OPO and uh, 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 experiments in theory. Wagner was Wagner and Jordi. Jordi Santiago was a visitor from Peru in our group and Wagner Buono uh, was a former PhD student that, that ran that, that, that uh, uh, ran the, the, the second harmonic generation experiments, okay? He's now doing a postdoc in South Africa with Andrew Forbes in Andrew Forbes group. And with that, I can thank you. This is uh, a view of Rio de Janeiro and Guanabara Bay seen from Niterói side. This is the bridge that links the two cities. Uh, so I cross this, this bridge every day to go to work. I live around here. Okay, and I work right here. So uh, this is to motivate you to come visit us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Very nice picture. Um, so any questions, please? Yes, I have one question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for extremely interesting topic. And I have a rather technical question. Um, uh, how long does it take usually to perform your numerical simulation? Well, uh, for instance, if you have some specific nonlinear media and you try to calculate higher, higher modes or some specific pattern of your radiation in a uh, far zone or close yeah. uh, to some, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, so far, we, we, haven't, we, we haven't actually done complicated uh, calculations, okay? We are starting to, because our, since our, our, the medium that we are working with, they are essentially optically thin, uh, any perturbative approach to those uh, equations uh, will be enough. So we do mostly some uh, analytical calculations and sometimes we calculate numerically only the overlap integrals that give us uh, some uh, idea of the relative uh, intensities, relative weights of the outgoing modes. But it's not a complicated uh, 
not a complicated issue. Uh, another, a different issue that we are starting to investigate is what, what if the, 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 the medium is not a thin one, but a thick one. And then you have to really uh, carry out all the calculations and then we have to resort to numerical, but we haven't done this so far. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, you're welcome. Stanislav, please. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, okay, Paolo. Oh, I can wait, I can wait, no problem. Okay, Tas, your raised hand. Okay, let me, okay, let, me let, let, let me start. So, <laughs> as you pro probably may, may know, we were playing for several recent years with uh, pump with orbital angular momentum for SPDC and things like that. So do you think we can expect something qualitatively different and interesting if we add some uh, vector structure to the pump in SPDC within ordinary bulk crystal? Can we expect some, I don't know, qualitatively interesting effects? Uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, your, your voice was really very low. I did not understand, the, I fully can, understand the question. Can you, can you, can you hear me now? So the um, a bit better. Is, the, the, the question is, if we add the um, vector beam structure to the pump in this PDC process, so do we expect to see anything qualitatively different and interesting from just an ordinary OIM pump? Yeah, OK, thank you. Yes, uh, actually. There is some, uh, uh, we, we have just published a work with uh, Paolo on the theory uh, about the transfer of uh, angular spectrum or spatial properties of a vector beam to down converted beams. Uh, and there is already uh, an, an experiment done by an Indian group. And the interesting stuff appears when you pump the down conversion process with the vector beam, but then you use the source for in polarization entangled states, which is, for example, we were, for example, doing our calculations for the source that uh, consists of two, uh, uh, two crystals uh, with their uh, optical axis rotated mm -hmm. by 90 degrees. So, for example, in this case, when you pump at 45 degrees, you can generate if they are, th these are two type one uh, phase match crystals glued together and with their axis rotated. So, if you pump uh, vertically polarized, you generate one in one crystal a pair of H polarized. If you pump H polarized, you generate a pair of V polarized in the other crystal. And then, if you pump with the vector beam, then you have this interplay between the polarization and the sp spatial mode transfer to the down converted beams okay there will be this uh, this uh, internal uh, entanglement in the photons between polarization and spatial mode but also there will be entanglement between the two different photons so the answer is yes. I think there is a lot of uh, interesting stuff to be done, but then uh, I think that the interesting stuff would would be to use uh, this vector beam pump with this polarization entangled uh, entanglement source with rotated crystals or type two. I don't know if it would work with type two. It it's more from the technical point of view. Huh? We approach this this two type one crystals because it seemed to us more, um, uh, how can I say, more appropriate for an experimental implementation, I would say. Okay, thank you. Sure. Paolo? Thank you. Very nice, very nice talk, Zella. You know, I like this business. <laughs> so uh, my question is, could you please uh, help us to, to have a more intuitive uh, 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 understanding of the whole of the goal phase in the selection rules uh, business, for instance, in the, in the story about the Poissonia spot? Because it, it, it seems to me, it's funny for me, um, all, all Gaussian beings should, be always, should always have the same uh, goal phases and uh, what happens? 
Uh, let me, okay. Let me go back there. So what happens essentially is the following. Uh, in fact, in doing the calculations, and also I think that uh, we, we, we didn't have a very tight focusing. We, we focused the beam to generate the second harmonic, but we didn't focus a lot. So we, we had this approximation that the Rayleigh distance of the beams, even in the focal region, the Rayleigh distance was um, considerably larger than the crystal. In this circumstance, the, in these circumstances, you can neglect the, the GUI phase uh, inside the interaction region. So inside the crystal where the nonlinear uh, uh, the, the nonlinear process is, is occurring, you can neglect the GUI phase over there. So the GUI phase business is outside the crystal, when the, 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 the beams leave the crystal. So we did not see any, any, how can I say, any effect of the GUI phase in this experiment of on second harmonic generation, okay? Uh, I, it's a bit different from, for example, for example there are people, uh, Sonia Frank Arnold in uh, Glasgow, she is doing exactly this, she's observing exactly the same and she has already published something about this uh, generation of radio orders and so on, but in four wave mixing. And then she, over there, she has uh, a cell, a vapor cell with several centimeters long. And then she cannot neglect. And actually she says that in fact, the gui phase must be matched. So what happens is that uh, uh, in, in, the, in the phase match condition, okay, when the crystal is long, you must also add the GUI phase for the, match, the, for the phase match condition. So the, the modes that, that participate in the interaction, they must be long, uh, the, the, the longitudinal phase matched, but also GUI phase matched, okay? But this was not true for us because our, our, our medium, our crystal, was just a few millimeters long. And the Rayleigh distance was like a few centimeters long. So we, are not, we were not very far, but uh, we could neglect the GUI phase uh, business in our experiment. And actually, the, what, uh, what we do, what, what happens here is that, let me see if I, What happens, the way that we understand the process, wait a minute, okay. So what, what happens is that the way, the way that we understand the process, why these radio, uh, radio modes are generated is essentially because, uh, exactly because we are dealing with a thin optical medium, uh, all the medium does in the second harmonic is to multiply the two modes, the, uh, the two incoming modes. So you have one, uh, one uh, the two incoming beams with orthogonal polarizations and they carry the, their modes. And all the, 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 the medium does is to multiply the, the, the two in, incoming modes. So what happens is that when you multiply, you see you have this monomial term here that is it has a power that is proportional to the absolute value of the topological charge. When you multiply two modes, this, this exponent here is added. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what, what is the sign of L. When you multiply the, the two of those, these are, these are added, okay? The absolute values are added. But the topological charges, when you multiply, if they have opposite signs, they are not necessarily uh, added in absolute value. They are only added if they have the same sign, okay? The absolute value, if they have opposite sign, the absolute value of the topology or the resulting topological charge will not match the power here. 
So you produce in the near field. Uh, what you produce is what we we call a, a, a we, we call it a, a radial angular mismatch mode. So the the you you have some kind of distribution in which the power here does not match the absolute value of the of the topological charge, and this diffracts. It's not stable. And what is interesting and less obvious is that you can you can take such a structure and mathematically decompose as a finite sum of Laguerre Gauss of pure Laguerre Gaussian modes with different orders. This, this is how the radial orders appear is is when you uh, decompose this kind of uh, radial angular mismatched pattern in terms of uh, Laguerre Gaussian modes. And this gives the correct uh, answer. This gives the correct answer for the radio mode generator. So we see this as a diffraction uh, effect, but with a finite number of radio modes. Very nice, very nice. I, I think I understood. <laughs> very good. Thank, thanks a lot. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Ranjit, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. It is related with degree of polarization. So, what is the value of degree of polarization at the output of nonlinear crystal? As, that's a very good question. We we haven't measured that. We we see that roughly it is linearly polarized. It's linearly polarized. Uh, but we didn't, we, we haven't done a, a very accurate measurement of this, uh, of this polarization, uh, uh, the degree of, the, of polarization, okay? Mm -hmm. but, but from our rough measurements, we, 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 we could see that it's uh, highly polarized, I would say. Uh, thank you. And if I think if uh, time allows me, uh, could you please answer one more question? What about the uh, relationship uh, of Manry, Manry Rho relation? So is it consult or uh, did you uh, calculate this Manry, Manry Rho relation? Yes, yes, Manly Rowe, yes, we, we have considered, in fact, actually, the Manly Rowe uh, relations were crucial to, let me, okay, up here. So, in order to find the analytical solutions of the three, these three mode coupling here, we had, uh, we, we used the Manly Rowe uh, relations because this they, it would uh, give us uh, it would uh, give us uh, immediately some important integration constants of the uh, of the uh, of the equations okay so and this is we we have a discussion the manley row we, we we call it the multi mode manley row relation so the manley row relations also they they should be satisfied uh, with some uh, uh, inside the mode structure Okay, uh, it's a complicated relation, uh, but it's all it's discussed. Let me see the reference. I think you all got the, let me see. I don't know where to put the reference, but you all got the slides. Uh, I sent to Constantin the slides. There you go. So this reference here, okay. Here we have an appendix where uh, we, we, we derive the multi-mode Manley row equations. Uh, relations uh, we mentioned in the main text, but we don't make many calculations. We have an appendix where we discuss and how we use it for the integration constants that that allowed us to to solve the three mode dynamics. Uh, th thank you. Sure. Uh, Okay, I, I have uh, some questions. Maybe it's it will be stupid, but it, excuse me. Uh, uh, your presentation is very nice and pretty, and it looks like a, a very beautiful toy. Uh, because uh, I know that uh, main Gaussian mode is much more stable than higher order modes, and uh, uh, the, for experimenter 
it's much more easy to work with uh, main modes. Uh, could you point uh, the problem, physical problem, where this uh, 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 this squeezed, but not squeezed, spiral uh, charged modes uh, can be used for for some physical problem, and main mode uh, is, is is not doesn't fit. Hmm. Ah, okay. Um, good question. What can I do? I know that, for example, uh, people. Yeah, so I think that your question is more related to applications. Huh? Uh, so, yes, what yes, kind yes. of application could benefit from uh, having uh, phase singularity in, on the beam? So there are few applications on this. So people talk about, for example. Multi, you can uh, uh, optical fibers, multi-mode optical fibers. They can sustain this kind of uh, uh, vortices, sometimes uh, phase vortices, but they also can sustain uh, vector beams, also. And this could be uh, an additional, uh, how can I say, a degree of freedom to multiplex information in an optical fiber. This is one. Uh, possible application one possible uh, but i think that uh, something that you can do better with uh, vortex beams uh, with respect to gaussian beams is to uh, analyze uh, propagation along random medium okay so this uh, phase singularity or even the polarization singularity is a very robust signature. It's a signature on the beam that is quite robust against uh, noise, okay? So some people are uh, uh, investigating exactly how to uh, transport information using these singularities and how, uh, uh, a longer random or fluctuating medium, okay? And I would say that this is a good prospect for a research on practical uses of uh, this kind of singularity. And uh, the point is that quite interesting is that, for example, there is also a further uh, instability is that when you have uh, a beam with a high topological charge, let's say L equal to two, three, four, for example, instead of having one single one very well uh, defined singularity with high topological charge as this beam propagates along uh, random medium, it tends, it tends to split in several L equal to one individual uh, singularities that are close to each other. But, and actually I believe that this kind of spread also carries information about about the random medium that you are dealing with. So I think in my opinion to objectively answer your question is that I would say that these singular modes, uh, singular beams, they would do better uh, than ga uh, regular Gaussian beams for investiga uh, investigating propagation along random, random uh, medium. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, thank you. I think our time is over. So let's thank again the speaker and um, thank all of you for interesting discussion and uh, see you all at uh, our next seminar, which will be announced later. So thank you and see you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity. I'll be glad to join you in, in future seminars. It's really exciting. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I may add your email to our mail 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 list, uh, our mail notification of our seminars, if you want. Okay, okay, please do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you all, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Ciao. <laughs>